بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Brothers and sisters in Islam inshallah after we have spoken about in one of the lectures about um, the different madhahib of the scholars inshallah as I promised you before that I want to talk about why the scholars have differed But before I begin going into some details, I'd like to explain to you that this is, yes, could be a little bit advanced topic, which is, has a lot of emphasis to do on fiqh. Um, but the scholars have written such books in this subject for a reason that is very important. For us to understand that when the scholars differ, they differ for purpose. They differ because there is reasons why they differ. They don't differ because they'd like to be different. The ulama wrote these books, like for example, we've got Imam al-Tabari, has a book, it's called Asbab Ukhtilaf al-Fuqaha, The Reasons Why Jurists Have Differed. You have Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah wrote a book, Raf'u al-Malam an al-A'immat al-A'lam, Removing the burden or the blame from the great scholars. Why? Because some people would say, why would Imam Abu Hanifa give this fatwa like this? Why Imam Shafi'i would give a fatwa like that? And people don't understand, do not know where these scholars are coming from and how they're structured and how they put together this matter and this opinion. So the old people will talk. It is actually a replica, today is happening but on a thuggery way. Yeah. And before people would talk, but now they are thugs. You see? Brother comes to the deen six months ago, he was smoking pot, taking drugs. Today he comes and he talks about the milestones of this ummah in, in, in our modern time. He talks, speaks about the ulama and the mashayikh as if they are his cousins or his abman gilli. Hmm? He used to play yeah? marbles with them down at uh, Holden Street, Lakemba. So, yeah, yeah. these are a'imma, but because the person becomes so jahil and so blinded, and he's blind, he can't see the real work, he thinks what? Well, it's easy. It's like when somebody walks about past um, the Opera House or the Harbour Bridge and looks at. Yeah, I can build something like that. That engineer who put it like this is just an idiot. He doesn't know. I could have done it differently. So, you'd laugh at him. Why? Because he's simpleton. Ya haram. You make dua for him. May Allah make him feel better. The next time we stop at a chemist, I'll buy you some medicine. Inshallah. The fatwa, akhi, to show you that how important is this topic, Huh? Really not many people turn out to listen to these topics because they're not interesting. But the same brother who doesn't turn up, he's happy to give fatwa. You see, he's happy to um, give fatawi in these topics. In fiqh, in aqidah, and in takfir, in iman, in islam. No issue. Kafir Muslim, take Muslims outside islam and give fatawi. That is not an issue for him. But to understand the scope and the matter and what the ulama have actually instructed their fatawi on, that is something. Uh, what does he know? And then the problem, the calamity comes where, akhi, you want to know where? When somebody says, and this is the, cor- the, the correct opinion according to the Quran and Sunnah. As if Imam al Shafi'i was following bid'ah in the Bible. And Abu Hanifa was following the Tawrat. Yeah. You see? That's what, this is, this is the problem amongst a lot of so-called student of knowledge, a lot of also shabab, and a lot of the youth who come to the deen, who thinks for them it's just one gear, one way. And then he becomes misguided, and he misguides others, and it causes him a problem. The ulama did their utmost to, what, to structure 
this fatawi according to the Quran and Sunnah and to derive from the Quran and Sunnah. But there are issues can happen that lead sometimes to a fatwa or an opinion that not necessarily other scholars agree with. And rest assured, these problems happen when in gray areas that the ulama originally found it very gray area and happened to the best of people as I will demonstrate for you. You see? So the problem here, Ikhwani, the matters cannot be that simple. And our great scholars, they did not differ on major things of the deen. They, measured, they differed on things which is, could be regarded as something that is a minor issues of the deen. We're talking ulama of sunnah, the great ulama. And that is why when the ummah disrespect its own scholars, the ummah is finished. When the ummah disregard the words of the ulama, the ummah is finished. Wallahi, this is what Imam Abu Hanifa said. Yeah, but I'm not going to adhere to what Abu Hanifa said. It is against the Quran and Sunnah. But yani, where did Abu Hanifa get it from? Yani? He's playing games, yani, pinball machine, and he got the opinion popped out. Or, yani, Keith, where did he get it from? Magic hat? Yani. He got it from the Quran and Sunnah. But the method of deduction, the way he extrapolated, the way he got the hukum, the ruling from the Quran and Sunnah, other scholars use different mechanism. That's why they came out with two different opinions. But you find they're not far away from each other. It's like comparing 22 karat gold with 21 karat gold and 24 karat gold. It's all, it's all gold, it's all very close, it's all above 21 karat gold, but you have to just, you know. But our problem, Ikhwani, this, 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 this mentality that some people have, it actually destroys and doesn't improve the fiqh, it doesn't improve the ummah. And the issue of why scholars like Ibn Taymiyyah and Tabari and others write books to tell you that don't blame the scholars. Why is that? Because all the scholars agree that the only infallible source is what? The Quran and the Sunnah. The rest is interpretation of the Quran and Sunnah according to the understanding of the scholar. One more time. Uh. Only thing that لا يأتيه الباطل من بين يديه ولا من خلفه. The only thing, the only sources that no falsehood come before it or afterward, from before it, behind it, or in front of it, is the Quran and the Sunnah. After the Quran and Sunnah, is what interpretation of the scholar from the Quran and the Sunnah. Underline the word the scholar. Yeah. Mush Hashash, yesterday he was smoking marijuana and scoring hashish and now he's a scholar. He says, I don't need to learn Arabic because I can understand the Quran and Sunnah without Arabic. Yeah, Habibi, ya <laughs> Sorry, because anyone says that, he's not a normal human being, there's something wrong with him. Sah, as one sheikh told me today, first before we talk to any brother, we say, can you please, can you open the Quran and read? <laughs> Habibi, he's reliant upon what? Translation of the Quran. And the translation comes from where? An understanding of a man what Quran is. It's not the divine word. But then when we say the understanding of a scholar, I don't want you to belittle what it means an understanding of scholar. Yani kif. Yani, a scholar of Islam, his mind is already trained. He went through the process and progressed to a level 
that he can combine all these proofs together. He can get the Quran, get the Dunna, the Arabic language, the Hadith, the, uh, everything together and put mixes them all together and tell you this is the path. Fahimd. Yani his brains, when he looks at the Quran and Sunnah, is ready to understand, to comprehend, to analyze, and to bring out the ruling from the Quran and Sunnah. And he went through the process of training when he was what? Seven, and eight, and nine, and ten. And when he was a baby, and he learned from his teachers. And he learned first and foremost, manners from the ulama. Hmm? Manners. That is the difference between seeking knowledge from the mashayikh, and seeking knowledge from the internet. That is the difference between reading from the book and sitting from the ulama and taking from the ulama. Because what you take first from the ulama is the fear of Allah, the piety and the respect. This is you don't learn in a book. A book will not hand you down this. YouTube does not teach you that. Facebook does not teach you that. Huh? Well, I can download a lecture from YouTube, I don't need to go to a shaykh. That is why you find brothers are so rude, so disrespectful, so in their conduct, so disregarding of the ulama, because they haven't valued the ulama. They haven't learned from them, they haven't seen the adab. They haven't said, Ya shaykh, jazakallah khair. Andi Su'al. And then he waits. And then the Sheikh points to him, Is'al. Then he asks, and he asks the question in full of manners. And then the Sheikh ignores him. He doesn't give him an answer. Or the Sheikh asks him a question in the class. What's this? And he gives him the wrong answer and the Sheikh reprimands him. He's used to what being criticized, put on the spot in front of his peers, his nafs is broken, to the ilm. He knows that no one is above. He hears from his shaykh, قَالَ الْإِمَامُ الشَّافِعِيُّ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ It impacts inside his soul, it impacts inside his heart. Huh? He hears that when he asks a question that has a condescending method or way towards another alim, he get hammered on his head. That if he does that, if he does not get kicked out of the circle, then what happens? He belittles himself and he learns. And then when he hears more and more from the mashayikh and the ulama, more and more he humbles himself to the ilm. And then, this is the first lesson he learnt. Not fiqh! Can you see this one? Right. Not hadith! Hasn't started anything yet. He started what? Humbling himself and learning the adab in the manas. Second, he start learning the fiqh and hadith and lughah and memorize big proportions of the Qur'an. And then after he finishes, he reaches an age 30 plus. Huh? He had been studying since the age of 8. 30 plus, 30 plus. He starts to what? Maybe the teacher can give him a spot when he's very smart to teach Beginners, maybe, maybe. And the teacher has examined him. Now you can sit down and not give fatwa. Not put on Facebook, Hada kafir, Hada mal'oon al walidain, Hada murtad. Huh? Not put a picture of a brother saying he's a murtad. Huh? Because you, 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 you have... Oh, he doesn't have kufr but taghut. La Habibi, if I ask you, define taghut, you don't understand. What is the root word of taghut? You don't understand. 
عرفت بس هيك جاهل خالف تعرف oppose the tide and you're known ها bring big words and people look at you as if you have علم خلقنا You want, sometimes you see stuff, you want to come out from your skin, you want to rip your clothes, you want to cry, you don't want to cry, to laugh, to bash yourself, to, 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 to knock your head against the wall. You don't know what to do anymore with some of these kids running around. al What were you saying? Now, then he's allowed to what? To replace, not replace his teacher, to teach the, the, the beginners. Then when he grows a little bit into the ilm, he's still learning from his shaykh. Until he becomes to a certain age where he can now talk in the ilm. He now has balagha ashuddahu. He has reached age of 40 or that close to that age. You can say, but ya shaykh, the imam al-shafi'i was 15 and the ulama said he can give fatwa. Habibi, when you become a shafi'i, I can tell you give fatwa when you're 15. Habibi, the shafi'i memorized the Qur'an, memorized not the Qur'an, all the poetry of the Arab by the age of 10. What are you talking about? And the habibi, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ You still need somebody, يضربك عافر, correct you when you're reading. What are you talking about? Huh? When then he's able to analyze. There is a certain age you reach in your life when you are able to put one and one together. You analyze things. You, you're able to give analysis to things. You have experienced them for so long, you can put them together. Even, you don't have to, it's not only in the Sharia, even if you are what? If you are a doctor, you are an engineer, you are even, even if you are a tradie, when you are at the age of 40, and, and life has knocked you since the age of 16, until you're 40, and you learned the maslaha, the trade so well, you are able to analyze things without even looking at them. Hmm? A car pa- pa- passes by, the exhaust maker smell, he says, it needs this, 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 by the smell of the exhaust. صح? Now he's a person who mastered. And he can look at, when it comes to Sharia, Al-Ma'alat. Al-Ma'alat is what? Al-Ma'alat, when you smell from the exhaust, a fume coming out, you say, in 30 kilometers, maybe this car going to break down. <coughs> that is called in Sharia, Ma'alat. Objective, Maqsad. You put the, the, the fatwa, and you say, this fatwa, ya Habibi, in 20 years going to give you so much headache, it's not funny. That is a alim who able to tell you this. This is when a person has reached a mature age, his brains have matured, and he's got the ilm, he's got the components. Now we call him what? Huh? When he reaches high level, a alim who can look into the Quran and the Sunnah and analyze and Now you can say, and then on top of that, ulama wrote books, said, hang on a minute, ya ikhwah. Huh? These scholars, there are things, maybe they're erred with. Because they are what? Humans who are not infallible trying to interpret the infallible. And this is when the Prophet ﷺ said, if he makes the mistake, he gets one reward, and if he does not, he gets double the reward. I'll give you an example. Malishi, maybe I'm not going through the details that I want to go through, but this muqaddima is important. I'll give you an example. One of the students, the main student, I think, Abu Hassan, um, he said, I had enough learning under Abu Hanifa. Are going to teach. He has, so Abu, Abu Hassan used to debate the Shafi'i, Habibi. <laughs> he said, Come. He asked him a few questions. One of the questions, as far as I remember, if a Christian woman married to a Muslim and she's pregnant, Hmm? And the fetus now has reached age after the ruh is blown in it. And she passed away her and her fetus. How is she to be buried? As a Muslim. See, Abu <laughs> Hassan did not know the brother knew. <laughs> How did, she's not Muslim. So she's not going obviously to be buried with the Muslims. 
but she's be- she's bearing inside her womb a Muslim. <laughs> of course, that is what that is a hypothetical question to get to see the level of ability to have analysis to the Quran and Sunnah and to give the fatwa. This matter could be trivial matter. Now how about someone gives fatawi to do with the wealth and the blood of human beings? We're talking about a lady who died with a fetus inside of her stomach. How about a thug who comes out to give a fatawi about the blood and the wealth of human beings? The blood and the wealth of Muslims. Talaq. Apart from a dima, which is so sacred, the, there is nothing more sacred than blood huh? and spilling the blood. Second comes the wealth and the honor of a human beings, which is what Arab. Now, brothers, Allahi. I want to show you that sometimes they haven't, they don't know how to read Arabic very well. They give khulu'. You know what, Khulu? Yeah, I'll tell you what. Yeah, your wife, sh- shift the severity of the fatwa. Yeah, your wife, the mother of your children, who you've been living with her with for 20 years, this brother makes her haram for you. Just because what? They know how to translate a few khutab, interpret a few th- things. They come to me, I wash him and I say, no, 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 go to Shaykh Abdul Salam, go to that Shaykh. <laughs> uh, they come to me. He goes, how am I going to make you haram for your husband? Yeah, let, let, let the elder mashayikh give fatawi. Why put on my bridge? Why be a bridge jannah to jahannam? Why you want to walk on my back? You enter jannah and I fall into the depth and the abyss of jahannam. Why? That's why you push. Right and other sheikh. Go to another. Go to the committee. Go to this. Hmm. And you feel fatawi from yeah, it's not even talaq, fatawi about blood comes out <laughs> cut and paste, yalla. Huh. Out of the he still he send you a snippet of a shaykh somewhere in Wop Wop land, he send you a snippet. Listen to it. That's a fatwa of such a shaykh, listen. Had hack fatawi, hack snippet of um and, and audio grabs and this is how Islam it become. We're living in a time that is عجب العجاب. You just sit there and wonder, wonder why, and then you will wonder why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is doing this to the Ummah. Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu was asked about an ayah in the Quran. Wallah, if I was to ask you, any one of you will give the answer. Hmm? He said, "Which skies will shelter me?" And which earth would carry me if I say about the book of Allah which I have no knowledge about? Now, now come, someone comes from. I love the brothers, they idolize the. the uh, when they were in Jahiliya, they used to idolize what? The American, Afro American accent. So, when they come to Islam, they idolize the English uh, London accent. As long as he's a brother who comes from Pakistan with a long beard, and he's originally Asian, huh? with a, they call him in, in uh, Asian with a long beard, and he's got an Abu name, he comes out and gives fatawi. And tafsir for Surah Tawbah, which the ulama buckle when they do tafsir to it because of the complexity of the ayat, you know. Huh? There is a kafir, and there is kafir, and the shu'ub kafir, and everyone is a kafir except him. Wallahi, if he's got the key for Jannah, he keeps everyone out. And he just locks it on himself. He says, I am the only Muslim. Muhammad was sent to me. And the brothers, they, they get high on this stuff. They love, the, the, the other brothers on the haq. Why? He's got the English accent. Huh? The Manchester accent. Or um, the Green Lane accent. Or I don't know what. He's got an accent. The British accent with what? Huh? 
And with better ilm and he knows how to shout and scream and he knows how to say, Kufur bi tagood, brother. Khalas, that's what deen hak. That's the deen of Islam. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. Where is the ilm? Where is the ulama? Where is the mashayikh? And bigger ulama who spent all their lives huh, sacrificed for this deen, seeking this knowledge. What happens? Huh? Now, this, this mashayikh dalala. <laughs> he works for the taghut. He works for the arana what? Is this now how we qualify the ulama? Is this how we, we judge the scholars of Islam? Then I want to ask you, as Ibn Asakir said, The flesh of the scholars is poisoned. What would you stand and say in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you have backbitten and slandered huh? the ulama of Islam? May we say, that one of the hasanat of Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala written for him ongoing reward inside his grave by people like the Ahbash making takfir on him and slandering him and backbiting him. He's getting reward. And you get a brother comes, Shaykh, is this Shaykh a kafir? This is how they talk. And you're laughing. And I... Just like that. That shows you that we are at the moment living in an era at the epitome, at the bottom of ignorance. Where I haven't seen Johel like that in my life. We used to talk... Hmm? About our gen- the, the generation of my parents, where you know everything halal, some me call, and you know all these things. No laham halal, no nothing, no nothing. Wallahi, this is far easier than what the bearded brothers are saying. We used to, I remember the lectures criticizing, he's listening, oh, your parents listen to Abdul Halim and Um Kulthum. At least when he's listening to Abdul Halim and Um Kulthum, he's not violating the sanctity of a Muslim, let alone a alim. When he's listening, yeah, we used to blame, and, and at least he's a jahil in the deen. At least he never studied the deen. At least he's not claiming to be religious, but you're growing a beard and you're claiming to be religious, and you're wearing the deen, but you're representing the deen in the worst picture ever. In the worst method ever. In the worst way ever. I don't know where I went there. I was supposed to talk the differences of being amongst the scholars. But that is, that is the, 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 the bitterness that we have today. And that is what is because of lack of understanding. Because we so far, we have, we have gone so far from the shores of understanding what is Islam properly. What is the true meaning of Islam what is the true hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa When you talk about the scholars, you need to understand what led them to the scholar. Huh? What led the, the scholar to this mistake? Or if it was to be a mistake anyway, to the, let's call it a difference of opinion. What led them to what? I don't like that word mistake. Difference of opinion. Hmm? That's why I called... The, the, the points that I'm going to bring is called Raf'ul Malam Anil Aimmatil Alam. It's written by Ibn Taymiyyah. Removing, lifting the blame of the great scholars. Because that is the manhaj that the Prophet taught us. Everyone, when they, some of these brothers who do not ascertain, and listen to the khutbah this Jum'ah, inshallah. Do not ascertain for anything. The first thing the Prophet ﷺ, we all, we, every brother, you ask him, tell him, Hadith Hatib. He brings you Hadith Hatib about when he spied on the Prophet ﷺ and sent the letter, Hadith Hatib. And the ulama say, the spy is this hukum. And I want to ask you a question. What is the first word said by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Hatib. You're a kafir, ya Hatib, I'm going to execute you. You're a kafir, ya Hatib, I'm going to do this. No! Ma hamalaka ala hadha ya Hatib. 
What made you do this, Ya Hatib? Who in this day asks why this person done this? Why did he say what he said? Why? The first question the Prophet ﷺ, not the hukum, and notice the whole hadith, the Prophet ﷺ never gave a hukum. Clear. That's why the ulama differed. Because if he gave a clear hukum, the ulama would not be differing. But the first question asked him, his brother in Islam, huh? he's the person who have khair for the deen. Uh, imagine a scholar, a person who has khair for the deen or not. The first, first question he asked him. First question he asked Hatib. مَا حَمَلَكَ عَلَى هَذَا يَا حاطب? What led you to this ya Hatib? Why did you do this for? And then Hatib put forward his excuse. We'll talk about this inshallah on the khutbah. But he said, ya Hatib, this is my excuse ya Rasulullah. You see? I have family and so on and so forth. The hadith goes. Now, who from us, before he speaks about any person, asks the first question, the first element to be satisfied, the first question, why did he do this for? Why did he say this? How come he said it? Can we talk to him? Can we ask him why? No. This is a sign of lack of justice. This is a sign of oppression. This is a sign of arrogance and a feeling of superiority, that you're superior over everyone else. And these are the characteristics of the people of Jahannam The people who the Prophet and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Prophet criticized. Characteristics that could lead someone to Jahannam person who see himself better than everyone else, superior to everyone else, and everything else is below him, that's a very bad characteristic. That's why the Prophet ﷺ could easily gave the ruling on Hatib. And the Prophet ﷺ, Jibreel descends to him. But yet, what he said, he said, What? Why? How come you did this, Ya Hatib? So the manhaj of asking and knowing and ascertaining is entrenched. It is one of the most important elements of our deen, our deen of Islam. The first important element in knowing something is to ascertain why. How many of us do this? Huh. Or hukum, 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 hukum. So Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, when he wrote this book, is to highlight for you and me, to get a, just a simple, a touch of the surface, why the scholars of Islam have differed. And specifically why the jurists have differed. What led them to this? Differences of opinion. Of course, I can't go too much details because it'll become t- way too academic and way too confusing. But I want to show you something and demonstrate to you from some of their method. The first and the foremost, huh? the hadith of the Prophet wasallam. Problems that the scholar, the scholar seen in the hadith. We know the Quran is what? It's all authentic, yes or no? Every word is multiply narrated and we have to bear of our creed to believe that every letter of this Qur'an was uttered by the Prophet wasallam, and prior to that by Jibreel and prior to that by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, so we can't say it's not authentic, the Qur'an. We'll talk about that. But the ulama still differed in interpretation in some of the verses. But when it comes to the hadith of the Prophet Let's go back to the best person after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu wa ardah. Here, um, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to continuously say, kharajtu ana wa abi bakrin wa umr. 
ودخلت وانا انا وابي بكر وعمر مينينج دخلت انا وابو بكر وعمر يعني كيف يعني هي انترز البروفيسور صلى الله عليه وسلم تساي اي انترد ذا هاوس مي انا ابو بكر وعمر اند اي اكزيتد خرجت انا وابو بكر وعمر اي اكزيتد ذا هاوس مي انا ابو بكر وعمر يعني وات وات داز ات مين مينينج ذا وير ذيس تو مين one of the closest companions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he spent so much time with them so if anyone to know the ins and outs of the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam abu bakr and umar would know the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam passed away who took the reign of power abu bakr a person entered upon Abu Bakr رضي أو an elderly lady entered upon Abu Bakr رضي الله عنه and he was asked about the inheritance of the grandmother يعني a, يعني a grandmother alive her grandson died so she asked him would I inherit anything Abu Bakr رضي الله عنه عنه said Um, I cannot find anything for you. Yani, in the book of Allah or in the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, but, I will ask the people. Shuf Abu Bakr. What did he say? He said, I do not know whether you would inherit anything. There is nothing in the Quran, nothing in the sunnah. And he is the most knowledgeable in the sunnah hmm, for you to inherit. But, he didn't stop there. He said, I will ask the people, meaning what? The companions. They're all still alive. They're all in Medina. So he asked Al-Mughira ibn Shu'ab, ibn Shu'ba. He said to him, yes, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave her the six. So what? So there is a hadith that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu did not know and others, Umran ibn Husayn and Al-Mughira knew this, a hadith about the, from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another example, Umar radiallahu anhu. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, and you all know this, came knocking on the house of Umar. He knocked the first time. Omar did not answer. He knocked the second time, Omar did not answer. He knocked the third time, Omar did not answer, so he left. Omar probably was doing something. He came out running. And he noticed that Abu Musa al-Ash'ari left. He got very upset. He said, come here. How come you left? Wait for me. He said, Wallahi, the Prophet wasallam said to us, if you knock three times and there an answer, Mm, who knows this sunnah? And he knocked the first time, the second time, the third time. Leave. So there is a sunnah that was known by whom? By Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, who came later to the deen. Yani, and he was not yani, all the time with the Prophet ﷺ like Umar radiallahu That shows you what? There are some ahadith that some scholars would know and some would not know. Is this scholar? Yes. Because no one can collect all the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No one person can. But the ummah collectively has collected the ahadith or not? Yes. But there is no one person can know the ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tayyib. Another issue. Another reason. Very quickly. That the hadith could have came to the scholar. But the scholar is suspicious of it. Uh, so he gives an, a different opinion according to an analogy. It happened to the best of people. Who? The big muhaddith Imam Malik. Huh? <coughs> a hadith has reached him, but he questioned the authenticity of it, even though this hadith is 100% authentic. Which is hadith what? Al-bayyani bil khiyari ma lam yaftariqa. The buyer and the seller, they have the option to rescind the contract as long as they haven't split. Meaning if I'm sitting, me and you, Sophia, he says, I, would you buy my car? He says, yeah, I'll buy it. Okay, $5,000. You agree? Okay, tayyib, that's $5,000. And, you know, I'll take your car. 
But they said, you know what? I don't want. Can I rescind you? Yes, you can. As long as we have not split. That's why Abdullah ibn Umar, when he used to make a deal inside a tent, he used to walk out. I walk back in. <laughs> why? So the contract is binding now. خلاص تفرقنا. So, of course, this is ahkam in uh, financial Islamic contracts. And why? Malik, the hadith came to him. But he didn't really huh, take it. Why? Because he has principles. And according to his principle, if the hadith not known by Ahlul Medina, يعني, because he used to live where? In Medina, then that has doubt in it. So he used to, Rahmatullahi alayhi wa radiyallahu anhu, he has this point that the, how can the hadith, look at the argument, huh? unknown, to be unknown to the Madanites, and it came out from the Medina. And how come all the students of the companions be living in Medina, at Tabi'in, and they don't know this hadith? So I treated to, he didn't say it's rejected, he said I treated with suspicion. And especially if it came from Iraq. He used to, he used to believe that if a hadith originates, yani who migrated to Iraq? Ibn Mas'ud and Ali. They had a hadith that others did not have, true or not? So when the hadith was said by Ali or by Ibn Mas'ud, who took it? The Iraqi students. So they come to Hijaz. With this hadith, he says, no, no, no. The hadith comes from Iraq, and you have so much fitna. <laughs> it's like it's always so much fitna in Iraq. <laughs> yeah, so much fitna. I'm not taking this hadith. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I will treat it with suspicion. You understand? So that is, he based that. But it doesn't mean he escaped the haqq. You'd find, subhanAllah, he will always have, they will always derive from another hadith. Something to fix this issue. Araft. So, and then the later show, the ulama who within the Maliki Madhab come to fix that and to find other methods and everything. So the hadith could have been received by the scholar, but the scholar never uh, trusted it. Later when Bukhari was collected and all of that, the hadith they started to become more and more popular. Tayyip. Another um, <clears throat> sometimes he could have forgotten the hadith. A scholar forgets hadith, of course. Like, for example, it happened to Umar radiallahu anhu. He asked the man, سُئِلَ عَنِ الرَّجُلِ يُجْنِبُ فِي السَّفَرِ فَلَا يَجِدِ الْمَاءِ Umar رضي الله عنه He was asked about a man who falls into a state of janaba. What is state of janaba? When you are on the major impurity. But he can't find water until he makes what? He can't find water so he can make ghusl and pray. Umar gave him the fatwa. He said, huh? He cannot pray until he finds the water. Then, Ammar ibn Yasir said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. Ammar ibn Yasir said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. Don't you remember when we, me and you, huh, we were on the Ibil, and we had the same problem of Janaba. Now, like, where they were minding Ibil and they slept and woke up and they were on the state of Janaba. He said, and I rolled in the dirt uh, as the Dabba, the animal will roll in the dirt and you did not pray. And we asked the Prophet wasallam and told us it is sufficient for us to do tayammum. He said, Wallahi, I forgot it. Shuf. If a companion, this could happen to him. How about other ulama? So there are, as you see, Ikhwani, um, reasons that the ulama could differ about. This is to do with what? I don't want to drag it too long. This is to do with the sunnah. How about also another issue? From the Qur'an and from the sunnah, that a hadith could be abrogated. 
and the alim did not know it was. What do you mean abrogated? Yani a hadith, the Prophet sallallahu Yani give you an example. It's a controversial matter. Hmm? The abrogation of mut'a marriage, temporary marriage. With consensus it was abrogated. Mut'a marriage that the Shia practice still today. It was abrogated, which is a man marries a woman for a certain time and there is no talaq. When the time lapses, she is divorced already. So they marry for three hours and two hours. It's like a veiled what? Prostitution. al muhim but this is one of the contracts that was prohibited towards the end of Islam. The, the, uh, towards the end of um, the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There are many, many different marriages that slowly, slowly were forbidden, like alcohol. Slowly, slowly were what? Well, um, uh, forbidden became uh, haram. No, it, did, it was in one phase, and one of them is the marriage, mut'a marriage. It is not until the battle of Khaybar where the Prophet ﷺ announced it and eating the flesh of domesticated donkeys are haram. Both of them, the, both of them together. And the hadith was narrated by whom? By Ali radiallahu anhu. Just as a side note, the ones who do it. Ali radiallahu anhu narrated this hadith. al muhim listen to this. Um, then until towards the end of the life of Ibn Abbas, who lived for a very long time, Ibn Abbas. Yani after the death of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali. When Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu stopped giving this fatawi. He used to give the fatwa with what? With the mut'a marriage. He did not know there is a hadith that abrogated it. You see? And that is a proof that sometimes the scholar does not know that this hukum is what? Abrogated. Due to lack of knowledge, sometimes of the timing. When this hadith was said, and when this hadith was said, when this first came down, and when this hadith came, the Prophet ﷺ said it. You see? And what is general and what is specific? Some ayat, when you read them with the Quran, you say, Whoa! It's a, it's a general ayah. And some ayat, what? Come to other later in the Quran, come to make it far more specific, to tune it and make it far more specific. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, Minhu ayatun muhkamatun hunna ummul kitab wa ukharu mutashabihat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said the Quran, Minhu ayatun muhkamat. Some ayat are muhkamat, specific, precise, and some ayat are unclear and general. So, the scholar sometimes, this is a scholar, no? Abdullah, huh? who yesterday was hanging out Liverpool Station. No, it's now, it's a scholar who comes and compares and says, oh, and some scholars don't even get it right. Araft. That is to do with what? With muhkam and mutashabi. And to do with general and specific. Sometimes the Arabic language could be a problem. Yani kif? Yani as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَالْمُتَلَّقَاتُ يَتَرَبَّصْنَ بِأَنفُسِهِنَّ ثَلَاثَةَ قُرْ And the divorced woman who still menstruates, they need to uh, to, to do a waiting period after the divorce, three قُرْ The word قَرْ in Arabic, what does it mean? State of menstruation, when the woman in high fever period. And in the Arabic language also means the antonym, which is the right opposite. Also in the, classi- in the classical Arabic language, it means the state of what? The state of purity. That is why Hanbal went one way and the Shafi'i went another way. Shafi'i took it as a state of purity and Hanbal took it as a state of menstruation. The, the, the understanding of the Arabic language is important. So sometimes the word itself could be problematic and left as general as it is. But why, someone will ask, why Allah will make it like this? Like why the wisdom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make such a thing? You know why? Because there are high and higher and higher and the highest in reward. If Allah will make everything... Where is the ishtihad? 
But it's the alim who's going to spend time and get it wrong and get a reward. And the alim who spend time and get it right and get double the reward. Where is the competition in the deen? Otherwise our deen becomes boring. Huh? And you find the minor issues, they're not major issues. The minor issues they differ about. Haraft. And sometimes could emanate rahmah to the ummah. I know the people say, oh, but the hadith, yeah, Shaykh hadith is da'if, khilaf ummati rahma. No, there is khilaf, there is rahma, which is what? Khilaf tanawwa'. Khilaf of variation. Where various opinions, if they don't contradict and bring about a disaster, could be some rahma in it to the ummah. Not shot fatwa shopping. Now there's a different story altogether. Araft. And also, the other issue is, al khilaf. التضاد, the opposing contradictory اختلاف that in the major, major مسائل of عقيده and like for example um, the sunnah and the other sects like the shia and this خلاف تضاد عرفت يا هذا علي رضي الله عنه he's a sahabi not infallible or he's infallible it can't be both at the same time صح هذا the خلاف for Abu Bakr or for Ali it can't be both at the same time هذا خلاف إيش but you find the khilaf amongst the madhahib. Yes, and sometimes can be problematic. But majority of the time between the madhahib, يعني between the Hanafi and the Shafi'i and the Maliki and the Hanbali, majority of the time is what? It's not, an, it's not a major issue. A classical example, placement of the hand in the Salat. Some took Hadith Ali. Like the Ahnaf. Where? Yes, it's a da'if hadith where you place it here. And some took a, the hadith in Tirmidhi that has an addition to place it on a chest. The others weakened that addition. Hanbal said, I do not know, Ahmad bin Hanbal, rahmallah, an authentic hadith to fix this problem. So as long as you grab the left with the right, and you place it anywhere, alhamdulillah. That's what the Hanabila on the opinion way, on the, on, on the belly here. بس يعني بالله عليك what's the big deal in that why we have to make so much fuss in the Arabic language we said the word قر عرفت take for example the words like محاقلة ومزابنة some scholars don't know this language of the Arabic because the Arabs have different dialect hmm like some of them, muzara, what it does it mean? It's like what? When you um, go to a farmer and you own the land, you tell him, come and work on my land and cultivate it, and we take share. Then the ulama differed. Who should buy the seeds? According to the understanding and the structure of the hadith and the language of the hadith and how it is structured and the usul of sharia and everything. Him. Otherwise, no alim would like to run away from hadith of the Prophet. ﷺ. And I gave you an example in the previous lecture that Imam Abu Hanifa himself, the people who say he, he did not want to follow the Sunnah, the one who will Billah go to that level, huh? He annulled the salat if you do qahqaha in it. You know qahqaha what it means? And when you if you laugh in the salat, like that. Your salat and your wudu annulled. He relayed, he based this fatwa rahmatullah alayh, on hadith that has some weakness in it. The majority of the ulama rejected, they said no. It only annuls your wudu and some ulama said it annuls whatever. Yeah, I need debate between the ulama. But he based it on a hadith, why? Even he left logic. Logic says if you laugh loudly, okay, we understand that you will lose your salat. صح. You, 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 you negate your salat, you annul your salat. But why would you annul your wudu? Where is the logic in that? He abandoned the logic, rational interpretation due to what? To follow the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. To give the hadith the power that is needed that we follow the Qur'an and Sunnah. Do you understand? I'll give you another example of the hadith of the Prophet uh, of an ayah in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, 
وكلوا واشربوا حتى يتبين لكم الخبيط الأبيض من الخيط الأسود من الفج eat and drink until uh, the white thread uh, the white thread becomes apparent from the black thread of the dawn so one of the companions went and put on his pillow a white thread and his and, he, and, and another thread next to it and he slept waiting for the white thread to become what? Uh, to be to, to, to become what? Yani the, the light, the sun yani the sun comes where? so high then the Prophet ﷺ said, you must have a very long pillow, then very long thread. Why? Because he's talking about the thread of the sun. But if a companion can misunderstand this, why scholar? Now, if a scholar did not understand it accurately 100%, Ya Habibi, Ya Bangistanian, huh? you're not going to understand it better than him. Sah? You're not going to understand it better than him, you're Pakistanian, isn't it? Uh, understand, huh? Grow up in Punchbowl Boys, and then we moved to Belmo Boys because they kicked you out from Punchbowl Boys. And then, huh? You hang out in Lakemba Boys, selling um, 20s, and then you come to the Masjid. Now what? Ah, Sheikh bin Baz, Minuhada, is not on the haq, he was working for the king. Billah alayk. Billah alayk. Doesn't it make you shiva? These people, they learned under the ulama, the great of their time, and spent their life learning. Who are you to talk? This is ikhwani, to show you a little bit of the great ulama, and, and, and why they, some of them have differed. Of course, ikhwani, <coughs> that does not necessitate that uh, the alim is not to be rebuked but rebuked by whom? Yeah, you go to a doctor you don't ask him for anything you sit there like a statue he gets a needle and he stick it in your arm Wallahi you don't dare to ask him what's in it and if you ask him what's in it, he'll tell you that's your business. Sit down and shut up. You see this? Uh, this shows that I have studied for the last 20 years. What do you know? Sah. You have to be a doctor to at least question the doctor. And if a doctor who's a specialist in, um, let's just say, uh, blood diseases, the doctor who's specialist in bone diseases would not ask him what are you doing. Yeah, they're both specialists. You know why? Because it's a totally different field. Sah. Yeah, Habibi, you go to a mechanic. You go to a mechanic and he gives you, I change this, I You don't ask him what's this for. You just pay and walk away. Hmm? Kif. You don't understand the difference between an air filter and an oil filter. <laughs> How can you argue with him? It's not your business. He's a qualified person in this trade. It's not to you to ask too many questions. And Allah, he were in a class. The brothers were surprised. He was doing the class on Saturday. Who's the alim who said that you... Um, uh, uh, Al Amidi. He said, and the Mufti is not obliged to give you his dalil. Great Shafi'i Imam. Usuli Ajib. One of the pinnacle of Usul Fiqh. He said, the Mufti does not have to give you his dalil. He's not obliged to tell you that's the dalil. When you come to the Mufti, you take the fatwa. Don't you trust him? Take the fatwa. Khalas. If you don't trust him, why are you asking him? You know, I build a habit. If somebody calls me and says, 
Shaykh, I want to ask you this. But I read on Islamic Q&A, sometimes I hang up and sometimes I don't. I say, okay, since you ask Islamic Q&A, why are you asking me? You ask Islamic Q&A, don't ask me. Why? Because that's lack of adab. Lack of manners. I'm not a mufti, I'm not a alim, I'm, I'm, I'm talib ilm. But the question here is, there is something called some degree of respect. So Al-Amidi rahimahullah said, the mufti does not have to give his dalil. Because if you are able to analyze the dalil, that's my words, yani, not him. He, he said he does not have to give you dalil, put a full stop here. Because if he has to give you his dalil, that means you understand and able to analyze the dalil, then you don't need him anymore. That's the logic behind it, why otherwise? But many of our ulama do give the dalil. Because when they give her to a lot of the time concern, their concern is maybe a student of knowledge who knows what the dalil and the value of dalil and able to analyze the dalil and then he is more convinced in the fatwa. But by principle he doesn't. In Latsu Mani Fatawi, if you read from the big ulama, one line, one line and a half, he gives you the answer and that's it. The answer according to the question, he doesn't go involved, especially if a matter hmm, to do with principles of Islam, like to do with what? Like kawa'at fiqhiyya, legal maxims, where there is no clear dalil to it. There is a maxim, there is a qa'ida, a general rule that dictate this mas'ala. So he gave the fatwa pursuant to that golden rule. Bas. <coughs> Tayyib. How would you understand this golden rule? It was narrated that an imam is Shafi'i. He was sitting in a halaqa and two men came and asked him. He said, Ya Imam. One person asked him, Ya Imam. What is the proof for? Tayammu. He said, إِذَا ضَاقَ الْأَمْرُ التَّسَعْ When the matter becomes restraining, it becomes, it, turns, it gives rise to ease and gives rise to wideness. Meaning, if there is no water, it becomes restricted and restrained, then it becomes wide for you to use what? Tayammum. Another man came and asked him, he said, Ya Imam, what is the ruling on Tayammum? He said, فَإِنْ لَمْ تَجِدُوا مَا أَنْ he mentioned the ayah. Then one of the students said, hang on, why one would give him a dalil and one you mention a golden rule? He said, I saw one. He does not have much ilm, so I gave him one. A specific ayah so he can understand. And the other one looked like a talib ilm. He already knows the dalil, but I gave him the higher dalil. A lot of matters in the deen, ikhwan, especially modern matters that occurred Modern in the modern times, a lot of the times, Ikhwani, it does not have an ayah specific to it. Like smoking. It's no specific ayah say, Dukhan is haram. But there are golden rules come from this. Like, La darara wa la dirar. No harm um, done to yourself, nor you should do harm to others. And Dukhan does harm to you. Smoking does harm to you. And it does to others. And it is israf. And, 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 and. So, that is a clear dalil. But how would you, when someone tells you, give me a dalil from the Quran and Sunnah? I'm not going to give you a dalil from the Quran. A person like this, you just tell him it's haram. And that is the fatawa of the great ulama from the ummah. Bas. You go details, he's going to give you, Ah, akhi, is it an ayah? I'm going to give you an ayah. What's haram? Uh, one said, yeah, but we read you now, uh, uh, Wallahi, one brother asked a shaykh here. And the shaykh, he was doing uh, like some sort of an innovation. Anyway, Allah yahdi shaykh. A brother came from the Stunch Salafiyyin, he came. He said, Ya shaykh, what's your dalil for this? He doesn't want to tell him he was, had manners because he doesn't tell him what you're doing is bid'ah. He wants a dalil. He said, Wallahi, ya ibni, if I read you a verse from the Injil or the Torah, you would not know. <laughs> you think it's from the Quran. <coughs> That's an issue. Araft. Sometimes even you think or you might believe that this is wrong from the Shaykh. You have to know where you stand. Otherwise you're going to get hammered. al muhim Ikhwani, our role, our duty, is to take from the ulama and respect 
the ulama. And be glad that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to this deen ulama rabbaniyun. And always be ulama. Always be great scholars. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not deprive this ummah from great scholars. But sometimes we need to listen to those ulama. Even if things we don't like. Huh? And believe it or not, especially the great ulama of the ummah, like al aimma al-arba'ah, and who followed them, the great aimma, And to know that only a person who is strong in ilm, able to rebuke ulama. But the easiest way to rebuke a alim is to do character assassination. You know what is the character assassination? To disqualify the alim. Alim, oh, he's sheikh, he's a scholar for dollar. Khalas, character assassination. You don't have to take any. You cut the road short by you what? Huh? Assassinated him. Khalas. So whatever he says is equal to rubbish. Sah? Or his alim taghut, he works for the taghut, he works for the sultan, he works for that. I don't understand how in our time some ulama are known for their ilm. And some of them were tested in this deen. Meaning what? Allah tested them. Some of them even was jailed and so on and so forth. Yet you see a thug because he doesn't agree with his cult. Huh? The shaykh doesn't agree with the cult that he follows. Huh? He call him a uh, هذا شيخ under pressure from the hukam. هذا شيخ جاهل. هذا شيخ does not know if قنواقع. هذا شيخ خلاص. Scrap him. طب what about everything he said? That worth nothing? And he forgets that this alim was teaching the ilm, not learning, when this brother was a seaman in the back of his father. I'll leave you with this. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa. Nastaghfiruka wa natuwulaik. Wa jazakum Allah khair. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.